Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Suisse and Dallas uh, May event. Um, we have had a few events this year, and we're trying to get out of the, uh, the COVID uh, um, phase. So we're hoping to have some physical events to meet you guys in person as soon as possible. But it's going to be another virtual event, and we're very fortunate to have today a great speaker. Uh, we're going to be talking today about inclusive design, and more specifically, the neurodiversity part of inclusive design. So. Um, I'm going to go through some very quick ground rules. So as always, thank you for Slalom and Precocity for being our sponsors for the last couple of years, they allow us to actually have those events virtually, especially these past couple of years. Um, as always, so my name is Greg Laclofi, and of course, uh, welcome Brandon, Christopher, and Brenda, part of the uh, Service Design Network Dallas chapter, who are going to help us today. Uh, moderate your questions and make sure that we have a nice and smooth uh, session with our guest. Um, as always, quick warning that this is recorded. So um, usually the event will be um, edited and uploaded to YouTube uh, probably by this evening, maybe tomorrow morning. Um, if you haven't had a chance to catch up on the, on the past uh, event, you can go to our uh, YouTube channel. I like, can see the past. I think we have 16 mm -hmm. different uh, sessions now. So we've had a very, uh, very uh, nice uh, showing of really great uh, speakers. Last time we had Erica Hall, which was, which was wonderful and very great speaker. So if you have a chance, go check it out. Um, as Brenda was talking about earlier, if you do have a question for three of our guests today, um, go into the, the chat window of uh, Zoom and, and make it clear uh, that is a question for the for trip. Um, you are obviously welcome to talk to each other and engage with each other, but if you actually have a specific question, we're going to gather those, aggregate those, and then we are going to ask trip at the end. Um, I expect us to go along because we have a lot of really interesting uh, things to discuss about, but we should get as many questions as we can afterward. So make sure that our crew is aware of the question that you really want to discuss. Today, we're going to talk about neurodiversity and inclusive design, as I discussed earlier. So um, very quick definition. What is inclusive design? So this is the British Science Institute that was in 2005. Um, the design of mainstream products and services that are accessible to and usable by as many people as reasonably possible without the need for special adaptation or specialized design. So this has been, uh, this is becoming a very prominent topic in the UX and service design world because we are starting to really pay more attention to um, people who are necessarily considered as mainstream. So this is very important now as we build services for people who are uh, necessarily our first persona. So this is becoming a very hot topic right now. Um, as a very quick snapshot, uh, Cambridge has done this, this very quick study and this is the British population, so it's obviously something that can be uh, also, you know, mapped over any Western countries is pretty close. Um, but you can see very quickly out of 64 million people, um, just left-handed people are 10% of the population. Um, and you can see, for example, um, over 10 million people in England have some sort of a hearing impairment. That's 15% of the population. It's a huge number. So as a designer, if you're producing a product or service that is requiring some sort of a bus activation, know that 15% of the British population will have a little bit of a struggle or a challenge to actually just you know, use your product. So, so think about this. Um, the important thing to remember here is that those are usually permanent disabilities. So those, those numbers that we get in the US as well as other countries, they usually uh, take in consideration that like 10 million people have a hearing impairment that is usually permanent. What we fail to see is that usually there are unexpected reach beyond that. So for example, in the US, every year 26,000 people suffer from a loss of their upper extremities, right? Um, and you would think as a designer, okay, this is, this is something we have to be aware of if we're designing a product that actually has requirement for both hands. What we usually fail to see or we're not quite aware of is that there are 13 million people who temporarily cannot use both hands, whether they have an accident, have a broken arm, or whatever it is. And also situational, there are 8 million people every year in the US who, because they have a newborn or parenting or they have an environmental situation that uh, make it difficult for them to use both hands. So all of a sudden, we jump from 26,000 people every year to 20 million people. And that's a huge difference when you start to develop a product that requires both hands. So that is something we need to be aware of as designers. On top of that, if you actually just increase that by the, the number of, uh, of senses, very quickly you realize that there actually are a lot of people who probably will struggle using your product. If you start with the, the touch, see, hear, speak, 
This is from the uh, Microsoft Inclusive Design System. Um, very quickly, there is a lot of people who are going to struggle using a product that are usually not considered being a primary persona. So let's take a really quick look at what it means. Um, inclusive design is not universal design. As you can see here, the most interesting part of this, this pyramid of inclusive design is that you have to be aware that you're not trying to design something for everybody. There needs to be an acceptance that some people uh, in your target audience will definitely need to be using some sort of like a specialized device or specialized you know, tool to get to your product. That's something you have to be accepting. Um, on the other hand, you can see here that inclusive design is trying to kind of like stretch. How many people can you just reach by being a bit more cognizant of who they are, what they do, and what the difficulties are? Interestingly enough, you can see here that the largest segment of the population, 37%, actually has mild difficulties, whatever those are. We're not going to get too much into the difficulties themselves. But be aware that the biggest segment of the population will struggle with your product regardless, right? We always think of people actually have no difficulties being the, the larger section. It's not. It's only 20% of the population has no difficulties. So if you go between this from 2003, so numbers are pretty, pretty, pretty similar right now. But if you start looking at how many personal population actually have can use your product, um, it's actually a lot of people um, will struggle a little bit with your product. So how do we handle this currently? Currently, most of us are working on teams that have chosen the 80-20 rule, right? So you design for the 80 and you hope for the, for the 20. There's going to be 10% here that will struggle a bit and person over here on both sides of the spectrum. But the general idea is that for the past 20, 30 years, you design for the 80% and you hope to catch some of the people who have challenges and, and, and you hope for the best, right? That's pretty much common, uh, common sense right now. So what happens when you do this? Well, this is what happens when you do this. And this is not, you know, trying to be, you know, you know, um, the US Treasury Department does a very good job. It's a very complex way to design notes. This is not an easy problem, but they have chosen to design for the 80 and to um, uh, take a chance on the 20%. The problem is that there is a very hard cost to that. And you can see that the US Treasury was ruled to discriminate against blind and visually impaired people because all the notes are the same size and the same colors and they're hard to read. Um, and that is a choice they've made, um, but there's a cost to that. You know, they actually have had to distribute free currency readers to people who actually requested one, and it was a speaking cost to that. So you can see why the 80-20 rule is not great. So what about a 20-80 rule, right? So I have been personally involved in two, you know, products or, or design uh, uh, products where they have decided to go the opposite. So you design for the 20, knowing that if the constraints are good enough for the 20, most likely the 80% of the population will have an easier time to use to it. And therefore you get very close to the 100%. Um, having been part of the situation, I would say this is not an easy path. This is not a cheap path. This is not um, um, something that a lot of businesses, even they consider having a strong leadership and actually want to actually get into this, this frame of mind. Um, it's, it's not easy by any means. Uh, and within several weeks, um, even if you have a committed leadership and you have the right resources, the right bandwidth, you get to a place where this is definitely not easy to achieve. It's, it's admirable, but it's not easy to achieve. So what does this mean to us? So we're going to talk to our friendship today uh, and knowing that inclusive design is actually a fairly large topic to discuss, we're going to be limited and we're going to try to narrow it down to neurodiversity part of inclusive design. Um, but what does this mean to us as designers? You know, we have the duty and, and the, the, the responsibility to actually kind of like think through this through empathy and other issues. Um, but it's a very important topic, as you can see, uh, there's always people talking about accessibility and we've had people in the past coming and talk to us about accessibility. Um, and we always refer to Domino's Pizza website lawsuit has been the, the legal precedent. Um, but this is no longer a nice to have. <coughs> Inclusive design is actually uh, something very important now. And we're going to discuss that with our friend Trip. Um, trying to go as fast as possible because we have a lot to cover. But Trip, welcome to the session. If you have a couple of minutes to introduce yourself. Um, Trip is the director of product design at Pearson. He used to spend a lot of time at Adobe, Amazon, and Microsoft. So he's very well versed into inclusive design and has many patents. He's involved with the Alexa teams. Um, so if you can 
tell us a couple of things about you and we'll just start jumping into the question very quickly. Okay. I, you know, I think that that kind of covers it. I think uh, in terms of maybe my background and pedigree around is less relevant in tech uh, and maybe more about uh, my personal experience uh, and uh, things with disability. Cause I think there's, uh, I grew up with severe dyslexia and it's really hard to characterize, like if we say mild disability or severe disability, experience is really subjective. Um, but I grew up around the disability movement. And I think there's a, there's a piece of this um, where, I mean, you said some things that I think are personally uh, perfectly reasonable, but there's, there's even in terms of design, checking our, some of our biases and the way that we might approach the problem. Uh, because I, I think that's, um, when we look at like narrowing inclusive design just to neurodiversity, um, you're still putting people in boxes. Uh, and I think like the, the, the challenge with neurodiversity and dyslexia uh, or, or inclusive design for that matter is trying to understand the problem more holistically and come up with a better solution that works for everyone. So it's not really about accessibility. Um, it's about better design. Um, so that's, that's me and probably like, I can talk a lot about stuff for a long time. So uh, I don't want to hold things up, but I think that may be a good primer in terms of like my background with um, the disability movement long predates my career in design. It sounds good. So Chief, if you don't mind, we're going to start asking you some hard questions and just tell us how you feel about it. And if you have any kind of like recommendation for us designers and how to think through holistically in terms of like the mindset is very different when you start thinking about the 20 versus the 80, right? Yeah. So let's go. So Trip, what are the biggest challenges neurodiversity and inclusive design need to tackle right now? So I think we need to uh, probably understand that the problem is way bigger. Uh, so you threw out some stats around percentage of the, you know, maybe 26 million people in the United States. If you look at dyslexia alone, like Yale, I think quotes, I've seen that uh, Yale says about 20% of the population has some degree of dyslexic processing. Um, the more conservative numbers put it at about 10%, but at the high end, that's about 66 million people, 66 million Americans. Uh, and, you know, if you include things like uh, ASD, auditory processing, uh, uh, ADHD, uh, sensory processing, all of these things, you actually discover that these disabilities are actually far more common than anyone wants to believe. And I think one of the biggest challenges as a designer is even when you bring the data into it, uh, people will negate it. They'll, they'll, they'll try to gaslight it and say, that's not a priority, right? Like even if you're doing something like a reading app uh, or why would we design for that? And it's more about how do you understand like what the opportunity is? I think like one, that's one thing where we look at accessibility around requirements or the threats, the regulatory threats or the costs actually the opportunities it's a it's an it's an innovation canvas uh it's 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 solving a problem differently than it's been solved before and that's where all the value is so i think like when you're talking about thinking differently about the problem um and also uh 40 of the self-made millionaires happen to be dyslexic so if you're looking at reaching high value customers uh the people that are worth willing to spend money on things that's typically um, you know, where you're, where, where the opportunity is. It also tremendously reduces costs depending on the se sector you're in. Okay. So this is what you recommend right now. It's kind of like just tackling those new, those new issues. I, yeah, I think, I think, um, don't fall prey to the empathy trap. Uh, I think designers like to say that we have lots of it. Everybody has empathy. Like if you don't have empathy, you're a sociopath, right? Which is maybe another type of neurodiversity, right? Uh, so, but I think like we, we can tend to fall into a pity party. Like we're, 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 we look at it from a standpoint of we're still looking down on, we're designing for these other people and um, you kind of undermine their essential dignity as human beings that have problems that are valuable problems we're solving. And there's lots of opportunity in understanding and solving those problems. Um, let's, let's go ahead and move to the next question. Um, that is related to that. Um, is inclusive design a new subdomain specialization of experience design? No, um, I would say that, um, it, as I said, like inclusive design is actually just good design. Uh, if you look at the at the 
places that actually took, I mean, at the time they called it accessibility, but the original Apple uh, computers prioritized accessibility, readability, and the beauty of the fonts. And, and, and if you look at iOS, it has sort of the gold standard on mobile devices. They've significantly outperformed in their UX over and over and over again, because they start from these principles of how do we make it easier and more accessible for everyone? Um, things like voice technology, uh, speech to text, uh, and chatbots. Um, if it weren't for looking at accessible technologies, um, the uh, like those things really wouldn't be possible because we wouldn't have the language learning models that make those things easier to use for everyone. Um, so I think I think when you look at uh, it's not a new subdomain; it's where you're willing to choose. Um, I do want to serve first world problems or real problems, right? Like if you want to solve real problems for people that are really struggling with it and willing to pay money to solve that problem, like that's better design. And the more you can understand that problem, that's, I mean, that's a, an inclusive approach because I think it doesn't just go to disability. It goes to people that may have inequitable uh, access to a system. You know, it could be people that are living with poverty or they're living with illiteracy. Like there are reasons and layers to go at that. And I think if you take a broader lens at the problem you're solving and eliminate your ego, it's easier to do that. And sometimes designers see themselves as the champion, but they don't necessarily see themselves as um, where they might be stepping ahead of what the problem actually is. So, so just to follow up on this, the next question is going to be like, what shifts are you currently seeing within service design uh, with the rising awareness of inclusive design? Um, I, well, I think there's something valuable when you're looking at things like journey mapping, uh, or swim lanes is you're detecting, you're detecting a lot of friction points in the systems. Um, and that experience, so I wouldn't describe myself as say learning disabled. You know, I was identified very early on and there was like a five standard deviation difference in school. Um, I was in a system that disabled me right? My intelligence was like 142 and my spoken vocabulary and my performative, you know, IQ in on the tests and the way that they taught was like 85, right? That was a mix match in systems, right? That was not necessarily about the, the person didn't change, the methodology changed uh, and the way that they characterized it. It's a lot of the stigma and the systems and the perceptions and the ways that we, we aren't really re like, if you look at the 80% scenario, usually you end up at somewhere between 40 and 60%, which means that you've only designed something that's 50% good on average, right? Why wouldn't we want to look at something that could be better than that? Like, why aren't we rethinking things like schools and these more complex systems that aren't as simple as an app? And that's, I think, the value that service design does is that it, it sheds light on the complex interactions between systems, intents, perverse incentives, all of the other things that actually lead to undesirable outcomes. So that's that's perfect segue to my next question is, how you describe the relationship between technology and inclusive design? Is it friend or foe? Um, well, technology doesn't have a point of view. Technology is a tool. Um, I think if we're looking at the industry, I, I think like it's really easy to ascribe malintent to a technology, but it's actually sort of maybe the bias or just the neglect. Uh, the, the, so, I mean, we have a problem in technology with, we call it bro culture or monoculture. Um, like, I think a lot of the problems we might solve, like we're solving Silicon Valley problems for Silicon Valley, our developers are solving Silicon Valley problems, not necessarily problems for, say, people in different minority communities or marginalized areas, right? So that's actually where all the opportunity is, but we're, we've narrowly focused on, well, the tech can do this, or I've come up with a solution. Now I need to go figure out where my product market fit is rather than starting from like, what's a problem we're solving and could technology solve that problem? Because it's a lot cheaper to do that. It seems like people are really resistant to doing it that way, but it moves a lot faster over the run you know, there's this, I forget, you know, I'm sure Brandon could probably tell me, but because he's nerdy like this, uh, is that there's a special kind of curve where the fastest point between the fastest distance between uh, two points is actually a curve that goes down like this. It's a special kind of curve. It's not a straight line. 
And that's the way that design works. There's a lot of effort. It doesn't make a lot of progress, but it speeds up and accelerates when you have the right level of design investment up front in understanding the problem you're solving. And then it accelerates engineering, it accelerates go to market, it accelerates insights. Uh, and that's, that's, I think, the opportunity, but nobody wants to believe it, right? If there's, a, there's a tenet of faith of like, well, in case, we, in case we can directly measure it, it's not really a problem. And that's actually where all the opportunity is. So talking of which, I'd be my next question would be like, how do you best communicate with business when discussing green design? So we just discovered over here could be very lengthy conversations over weeks or months about, yeah, the ROI of inclusive design, the ROI of design, you know, all those things, you know, need to be, there's a cost associated with it. There is like bandwidth, you know, so what you're asking business to do is to do something uh, that has that is it's going to cost more money. It's going to take longer time. It's going to be more testing, as you said. The, the, how do you convince them? It's going to speed up eventually. Uh, sometimes you have to prove it first. You have to have a couple of mic drop moments on, like, yeah, I'm not going to do it your way. We're going to do it our way, uh, and maybe we do it as a as a little bit of a subversive thing. Um, and honestly, I don't try to communicate. I don't try to appeal to. Uh, appeal to their morality or their decency. I try to appeal to their greed uh, because if you work hard enough at it, you can actually prove the value of what the addressable market is or the unmet business need. Like it's a business case, just like any others. It's just that you're, you're like how you would go about doing it. It's not going to show up in a marketing survey unless you're really careful about how you instrument it. Uh, we did this when I was at Varsity Tutors where I had this suspicion around over-indexing um, and, uh, around where our opportunity was and our highest lifetime value customers are. And over a series of surveys, I asked one question. And the pivot question is, if you or your learner ever been through a 504 or an IEP? Now, if you've never been through that with a child in public education, you have no idea what that is. If you answer it, yes, it's strong signal for somebody that may have a, a diagnosed or undiagnosed uh, difference in how they learn. Uh, now, we found 40% of respondents said yes to that question. Now that's two X, the most advantageous, like the most. And when we actually went and calculated the lifetime value of those customers, because there is a genetic connection, strong genetic connection with dyslexia and ADHD and everything else, um, it runs in families. So you may have multiple learners. So those, the lifetime value of those customers were seven to 10 times what the average customer was. And we had never marketed to them. We had never designed features for them. Uh, and so when we redesigned the platform, we started with accessibility first and looking differently at how do we solve these problems to actually meet the unmet needs and not just sort of slap together the, the good enough or the best practices version of it. It actually requires really critical thinking about the nature of the problem you're solving. So based on your experience, now we've talked about the fact that you are very involved into Amazon Alexa products. Um, do you have a recommendation of what not to go to business with. If you actually go to business and you say, I want to be designing this because of that, they will shut it down every time. Um, as designers, you know, how do we put ourselves in a position of success where we can actually design great products and services that are inclusive, um, that are supported by leadership? So I think it's really easy. And I, I'm a veteran of this. Like I will talk the, fade, the paint off a of fence and I will pick, I will pick a fight just to argue it, right? Because I, I like the, the rigor of it. Um, let your work speak for itself. Be artifact driven, which my SVP, Mike Shitty says all the time, uh, is like show, don't tell. So if you have a better idea, uh, whether it's bootstrapping your data or finding the data or doing some AB, like it may require some extra work and say, Yes, and we didn't ignore what you wanted us to do. Here's, here's the hot, hot trash you asked us to do, and here's what better looks like. And we started from here, and we took a little extra time, so sorry it's late, but like the results are X times better, right? It's, 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 about, like, it's about how far you're willing to go. If you want to be understood as a designer, deliver value. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the part that I think... Um, Arguing from a point of view of like, we're trying to do the moral or the ethical thing that might work in some organizations, but 
organizations sort of run on their revenue. So if you can prove the, the value of it, people will adopt it. So, so let's talk about this a bit further. So that's my next question is like, do you have concrete examples of how great you know, leadership most likely is uh, tackling inclusive design? So, I mean, you've seen, I don't want to use Amazon all the time. You know, we have great companies that actually do make an effort like the Apple or Starbucks, Nike, they actually have some strong uh, initiative into inclusive design. Can you tell us a bit more about people you've been involved with and how do they tackle this kind of problem solving in terms of mindset? Um, I think it depends on the organization. Um, I think I think there's a lot of positive intent around things like Nike's efforts. But if you look at um, the reception of things like their their no tie shoes, um, among the dis- the people that have those disabilities or within the disability community, it's actually quite negative um, because it was essentially. Um, say me as a white person going in and say, I know how to help the African-American community and to go in and solve that problem. Like, no, you don't. Like I, I need, I need, I know, I know I can be open and I can be curious. I can help maybe bring some of my expertise, but you need to actually bring in some of the lived experience of that and stop designing for people. And I think that's where co-design can be really powerful in service design. I, tend to really love charrette, uh, which comes from urban planning and from architecture. And this notion that we're all peers before the object. Every human being is a problem solver, right? We may not all be designers, but we're problem solvers. Uh, and um, we're going to see different things through in, in what we're seeing in front of the wall or what we're designing together and get better insight uh, with that. So I think like if you can be intentional about designing the process, and how we actually go about solving the problem, but involve the right experts in the room to help inform that point of view with a lived experience or with data or whatever, um, you're going to come up with a better result. You're going to, you're going to certainly going to learn a lot. Do you have one or two concrete examples of like, you know, people and companies who've done it right? I think Microsoft does it very well. Uh, or at least they've invested in it. Um, you know, uh, my friend Bryce, who runs the Inclusive Design Lab, there, they bring in people. They do co-design. They 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 involve folks in the design process uh, in in a very intentional way, and that comes from the top. Uh, you know, Satya Nadella has a son who uh, is on the spectrum. Uh, you know, uh, I think he's a, a level three ASD. He's nonverbal, right? And so, but he sees the potential in his son. And he sees that, you know, is that poten- should that potential be wasted? Uh, Jenny Le Fleury, who is, uh, you know, deaf, uh, is their top chief accessibility officer. They've put people in positions that have that lived experience that, um, or are, are very close to someone with that lived experience. And they've, they've accepted with some humility on, we need to get it right. Uh, we need to listen and not solution. And I think that's, that they're unfortunately one of the very few that I've seen do it well. So are you saying it's mostly about the leadership and people actually do believe in inclusive design versus tools, mindset, frameworks? No, because as designers, you know, um, what can we do to be better? Because, you know, if you don't have, if you don't have any disability, if you don't have any of family or friends that actually is visually impaired, you're going to be limited in your understanding and empathy about how to design an app that can speak to somebody, right? So um, I, can wa- I, I can probably tell you uh, of a very specific example of when I was working on Alexa. Um, and it was uh, user research of watching people that were blind or low vision uh, trying to open the package and set up the Alexa. It's written instructions has to be on a screen. You have to be able to read to see it. You have to, this is a voice only experience. Like how much of a fail is that? That that video, watching that lived experience can be very powerful uh, and grab people's attention. That's how you use empathy as a designer. Is you you empathy requires that it hurts a little bit to look at it. It's not just about feeling sorry. It's about feeling bad about what I could have done to change it. Uh, and so I think there's there's a there's an element of that. And at Amazon, like in terms of how do I convince people, 
we were have a backbone, disagree and commit uh, bias for action. And there's sort of a come at me, bro aspect of like, I'm going to go do the right thing, be biased for action and do it. So you get better by being better. Right. It's like, come back with, you may get fired from some jobs. They're probably not jobs worth having. Right. So it's, it's, it's about like, be so good that they, they need to be right a lot. It's another Amazon call out. Right. So is that if you can, if you can do that, consistently and kind of keep your North star of like, I design for people and I try to understand their problems and I look for the opportunities in their problems. That's a good solution. People don't buy, it's the old saying, like a man doesn't buy a drill. He buys a quarter inch hole, right? Look for a device that makes a better hole and you will not have a business problem. So Chip, earlier I took a, I took a stab at the U S treasury, you know, and there are going to be some businesses that, Regardless of the intent, the the willingness, the leadership, the commitment, the resources, they're still going to be struggling, right? Designing a currency is very complicated. It's very, there's a lot of like compliance, governance, legal aspect to it. Um, I'm sure they've tried their best, um, but there are some companies out there who just they just simply have a difficult time being inclusive by the nature of the process or, or the product. So, what do you recommend us designers who may be in a position where? It is just not a priority for whatever reason. How do, how do we deal with that? Um, I wouldn't invest. I wouldn't keep them in your stock portfolio. Like, like that's the, that's the thing. I mean, that's the opportunity. I mean, without a specific example of a company that doesn't prioritize it, like there's some people that learn from the carrots, the early adopters, the people that look at the opportunity. And then there are some companies that learn with sticks and the regulatory Part. Like if you get to the point where you're out of compliance, like WCAG is bare minimum stuff. Like that's just, that should be shot, uh, ship blocking uh, elements of like, if you're got inline gobbledygook coding and, you know, semantically poorly formed stuff and no alt tags. And it's just a, it's just bad. It's just not a good product. Right. Uh, and it doesn't scale. There's probably all sorts of technical debt that goes with it. And so companies, I think, fall into um, sunk cost fallacy of like, oh, God, it would be so much work to redo this. But it's actually not. It's not that, you know, all of the things you wouldn't do again. Right. The ambiguity of the problem and, and what could you make easier uh, operationally or from a business perspective? Um, sometimes starting over. And that's a, that, takes a, that takes a gut check at the leadership level. But sometimes you move faster by going backwards than forwards, right? Uh, sort of just getting through doesn't necessarily get you to where you want to go. So again, as designers, what do you recommend for us to actually have a voice, even though there is, it's a good company, good product, good team, you know, all the boxes are checked, but something has to be shipped by Christmas, right? And people are going to come to us kind of like, you know what, it's, it's, I really get it. You know, we're really trying to be a good company here. We really care about our customers. We're going to ship this by November 15th. Um, what can we do to make it better? If you're starting from we need to do it to be good people, you're probably wrong, right? It's about being smarter uh, as a business or pushing on the business case, right? So it's not, because I think like that's the element where it's really easy to slip into the perspective of privilege where you're looking at like, well, I'm a good person because we've prioritized inclusive design or we've prioritized accessibility. Um, but you're just, it's just not, it's it, like, that's a blind spot and it's a blind spot. So, so my, my next question, my last question before we jump into the, the audience is that based on what you just discussed there, how do you build a career environment that fosters neurodiversity and inclusive design? So as a design lead or even as a designer, how do you get the right stakeholders to think alike and to kind of agree like, yes, let's do this because we want to be smart. So how do you actually just build that? I think, I think there's the thing of like, we want to, like as designers, sometimes you have to push for unpopular or un, like what would not be, you have to take risks, right? So when I build out teams, I look for in, in, in schools, they call kids, kids like me, broken combs, right? Like high intelligence should be in gifted and talented, but can't read, right? Like these gaps and like, it's like a, a T shape, uh, but you have all of these other talents and standout things. It's like, 
I'm only disabled based on the definition by an old white guy with a beard from 150 years ago. Like the human brain's 100,000 years old, right? This is, there's a, there's better theories on a complementary evolution and co- complementary cognition and the value of these cognitive styles. When you get an intermixing of this different experience, different ways of thinking, you end up with better results. And part of that means that you need to invest in the gaps as well as the strengths of your team. You need to look at like, how do I interlock my team in a way where I've got people that are offsetting each other's weaknesses and we're better together. Um, and I think like sometimes those are controversial hires. Sometimes that's the, the person who was the high school dry out, dropout was a hell of a coder and has good product sensibilities, right? Or the person that is a career switcher uh, or um, like it's sometimes it's easier to build the bench than to wait what comes out of school or comes out of a, out, out of a boot camp. Uh, because a lot of what we do is you learn it. You can't learn it in a class. You actually have to learn it on the job. And I think uh, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, my favorite Martha, uh, who is uh, uh, my HRBP. Uh, and she's not spying on me here, but my HR partner um, is having building alliances within the organization uh, and building people that are going to help support a point of view and, and, and how does this align on our, uh, on our diversity goals, right? If you, want, if you want to look at high potential people that are coming from minority communities, they aren't going to necessarily be graduating from Harvard, right? They, because they had so many things stacked against them, including very li- far more likely undiagnosed learning disabilities. So very high intelligence, very high talent, but they don't pattern match against your resume. So how do you how do you prioritize real inclusion? And I think when you look at those invisible differences, that's where the opportunity is. So again, to be pragmatic, so what recommendation do you have for somebody like a hiring manager like me? If I'm actually looking to hire 10 people, what do you recommend I look for in order to build a team that actually would have this kind of mind frame versus just resumes and LinkedIn profiles? How do you find that people that actually can make your team stronger? So I think you look for the people that don't fit, right? So like you see this, this thing where it's like, wow, uh, they don't have a, they have a degree in X, Y, and Z area, or they don't, right? Um, and then they, they, they learned, they taught themselves how to code and they do unity uh, and augmented reality. And they play in like, there's this weird mix of diverse connections like us a lot of times with people with ADHD they've got all these interests and they get and they're and they're and and these big these big sort of leaps and bounds and they're willing like when you grow up different and you fail a lot in school you have these things where it's just like go big or go home right these things where it's just like up or crash like there is no middle right there I'm not going for 50 percent I'm going for 80 percent plus right and so you look for those types of people on where are your diamonds in the coal mine, the people that don't necessarily match. And when you talk to them, you're like, wow, this is not what I expected, right? This is not like, like go into it, not assuming, you know, uh, and I, I, I don't, I don't know how to make it necessary. I mean, I can pattern match on it pretty easily because I can see it. Um, uh, I usually, a lot of times I'll, I'll be in a conversation with somebody and I'll start talking about it. I was like, when did you learn to read? Right. Or, or, you know, like you're, you're, uh, you know, it's like, you're really smart. Like, tell me about this 2.2 in undergrad. Right. Um, and so, so, so trip, currently there are some initiative, again, this is becoming a thing, right? So in, for, in a good way, but there are some companies out there like Ernst & Young, like NY, for example, they actually have some initiative. They actually seek out people with autism and they go and they hire them because they have autism because they realize that they think different and they can actually bring a very different lens onto a team. So they go out and they seek them. I don't know how they find them. I'm sure they have a way of actually going for them. But do you recommend people to actually start necessarily advertising the fact that they have this ability to be more like searchable and you can actually find those people since it's actually becoming like a skill set to be looked at for now? I think it's tricky uh, because I have a friend who's on the spectrum. He says, uh, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Um, and the same thing with dyslexia. Um, it's, it's, 
it's categorized by its symptoms, not by its causes. Its causes are unknown. And it's because they're just natural brains that evolve differently, in my opinion. Um, it's also, there's a ton of stigma um, uh, that goes with it. Like self-disclosure is a lot like, I mean, I, I, I tell people, and this is a little controversial, is like self-disclosing around a learning difference or some sort of neurocognition difference is not dissimilar to the way that uh, 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 LGBT people were treated 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? It was, it was only removed from the DSM-4 or DSM-3 in 1972 as a disorder, dis, uh, homosexuality. Right. Uh, same thing with transgender. There's t- there's tons of stigma and bias against it, and people assume you're dumb. So it's not something you want to go out and wave a flag about. And and that, I think that's why I get a lot of people that engage with me on LinkedIn because I'll I'll wear it on my sleeve. Um, and I can also recognize it in others. Uh, but it's also uh, there's no incentives to like trying to get accommodations for your differences with say IT or processes of like if you have ADHD or a lot of sensory issues and he puts you in a big open bay office and you just need some place to be quiet and not have everybody walking by your desk and constantly interrupting. Like the, the attitude is, why are you special? And that's, it's because you can't see how much I actually have to struggle to get the work you make me do versus the work I'm able to do uh, sure. different than everyone else. So what do you recommend? So if I have if I have dyslexia or if I have autism, do you recommend how do you recommend me with a self-disclosing kind of like, hey, I can I want to be hired by your team because I can bring this, this, and that. And also I have visual impairment. You're that's why disclosure is I'm taking it on trust that you're a good person, not a bigot. Uh, you know, that you aren't gonna immediately uh, characterize me as somehow less than uh, another, you know, the old saying, nobody gets hired or nobody gets fired for hiring IBM. Right. So like, if I don't pattern match or I'm, I'm trying to pass as much as possible for somebody that looks normal and just sort of have my strengths, I, ironically, uh, since I've sort of owned a lot of my differences and been increasingly more public and like very forward about it. It's been, um, it's allowed me to uh, have a stronger point of view on that rather than trying to uh, apologize for it. Uh, as and, and so I think it's about, it's characterized as a disability. I don't really believe it's a disability. I think it's just a, some broken systems and some, some, some bias that okay. probably, probably can be worked through. So Trip, we have, we could talk about this for another six hours, but unfortunately we have quite a few questions to get by you. If it's okay, we're going to open the floor to some of the audience because there's some good questions. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Brenda, do you have a question from the audience, please? Yes. <clears throat> so what advice would you give to increase the inclusive culture in large companies? Do you think there is an effective way to, to make this happen? And it's along the lines where we were just talking. Um. Well, I think a lot of companies are going to be faced with transformation challenges. Um, you know, they've got IT policies and systems and hiring processes that just don't work in a hybrid model. And most people don't want to go back to a traditional office. It's like they, there's a thing that came out on blind. It was like you offered people a $30,000 raise versus going back to the office. And they, they said, I want to go back to the office. So I think when you look at cultures that need to transform themselves, there's an opportunity to look at how can we actually hire up people that might not have been a great fit in the office, but are awesome. So people that may have, um, a lot of people that um, have autism uh, are may struggle with normal social interactions face-to-face. They're great on text, right? Or they may struggle with masking uh, is what it's called, and masking in a normal, it's incredibly stressful. You'll get way more out of them out of remote. So I think it opens up a whole new category of people that uh, if you can think bigger about how you recruit, and what you recruit for um, and how you evaluate. Very good. Thank you, Trip. Um, Robin, do you have a question? Yeah, Trip, we've got a question from Janice here. Uh, she's looking for advice on co-designing in ways that actually achieve that with 
versus just the lip service of, you know, we brought a group in and did an activity with them. Um, I think, I think it depends on, like, you don't want to, you don't want to, like, there's no dial, dial up for disabled people, right? Like there's no, like, like, I think it's, what's the nature of the problem? that you're trying to solve and how do you connect with those people in a normal way? Like it's a business proposition, right? Would you hire them to come in for the length of the period and consult with you? There's plenty of disabled designers out there. Uh, they may have a particular lens on it, even if it's not their known experience or their, their lived experience, they're more likely to be connected with people that it is uh, people that would be, and, and it's always going to be qualitative, right? And you can always look at the expert stuff and the, is this a trend? But I think there's an element of um, you can you can find the right people if you kind of understand like it's kind of a no brainer to figure out like if Alexa is going to work the packaging is going to work for somebody who can't see right and why that why that device might be valuable for somebody like that if you're not thinking in those terms uh, around what can go wrong versus how awesome this is um, I think you it's almost like you want to say all of the reasons this is a really crappy product and all the ways it could be wrong. And you might start looking at why it, uh, how it could fail and how to make it better and get the right people in the room to look at it. I love that point about the not seeking validation, but seeking, right. seeking the blind spots when you're doing the testing or you're bringing someone in to co-develop like that. Cause that that's where you get the rich stuff. Seeking validation, if they're nice, they'll tell you it's great. And then you won't learn anything. Well, if they feel involved versus sort of pandered to, um, you know, if they feel like you've actually engaged them and that their opinion, their their input actually matters. Their input could actually inform. Um, there's a pro- I mean, that's incredibly valuable with co-designing with stakeholders. Um, you know, that's the that's the that's the Jedi mind trick of like this is our win together. We've all designed this together. Isn't this great? Right. And when you have that meaningfully engaged, and I think finding methods and tools to do that can be um, prioritizing that where everybody can do it. it, it it's a so, win. So talking of worship, I think that uh, Brandon, you had a question from Janice around tools yeah. methodology, go ahead. Yeah. So one of the things that I've heard, in fact, it was when you were and I were at uh the IXDA conference in, in Seattle a couple of years ago, um, one of the people talking about this topic spoke on nothing about us without us, mm-hmm. right? This concept stop. And, and it can be for any, that can literally be anybody. It doesn't have to be dyslexic or ADHD or whatnot. It's just don't do stuff about us without including us in the process. And, and Janice Chan asked, uh, do you have any advice for co-designing in ways that achieve designing with versus for, as opposed to the appearance of, of lip service, the appearance of doing this. And, and, and I want to extend upon that. Like, is there a difference of co-design between involving them in the research that you do, right? Is, 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 are you talking about like embedding them on your UX team, on your UI team? Uh, or is it talking with them just in research? Is it a combinatorial approach? How do you look at that? It's a good question. I think like if there were, so one of the major problems in disability communities, and this is one of the areas where I've got privilege because I don't look like I've got a difference, um, is, uh, is underemployment, uh, especially among people that are blind or on the spectrum or what have you. Um, and if they're good enough to help you out of a bind with your product, why aren't they good enough to work on your product? Um, you know, and how do you create the right apprenticeships or right opportunities? Like Figma is learnable, right? Like if you, if you're hanging your hat on being able to use Figma and Mural, like eventually they'll train chimps to do that, right? Like you want to be, you want to be hired for how you think and how you solve problems. Uh, and so if you have that talent, is all around us, right? They just may not have the pedigree. So it's, again, it's identifying those diamonds in the coal mine. Like you should be looking at that as, can we bring this person in on a consulting basis and look at them as an odd, you know, as a, as a, as a value add, 
uh, both to the culture, but to the team? Are they bringing it like, why wouldn't they be able to work on a login, right? Why do they have to specialize in accessibility? That's, that's huge. And, and there's, there's a really, I, I don't think we've had quite as an amazing kind of chat ongoing during, during a meeting. There's really good stuff going on in chat. So like sorry, the- you don't get to see it, uh, Trip. We're kind of bouncing back and forth, but there's a lot of good supporting material there and a lot of support for the things you're saying. Um, and of course, the YouTube channel won't get that either, but that's why you come to these live, right? But I, that, that's, I really like what you're talking about. And we talk about that all the time too here. Is like, is this person going to be a good culture ad? Like we're not letting culture fit, then you just get a whole bunch of people that look and sound just like you, which of course will tank your company because you, you know, anyway, reasons. So I love the value add of, of just don't think about it as, as I'm, I'm hiring to fill this specific niche. I'm just hiring, period. They happen to be from this niche because I'm adding that their, their experience, their life, uh, to our overall team, which will enhance all the stuff that we do. I, yeah. I that was my interpretation of what you said. I, I really, really like it. And I think that's the pathway, like that. A lot. I mean, we talk a lot about oh man, the pipeline for design breaking into design. It's so terrible. It is. It's horrible, and it's because like we, you know, we we expect like entry level people to have seen. You know, it's you say everybody wants to hire a principal designer with low self-esteem, right? Um, you know, that they would, they would take a, take a job that they're way overqualified for, for a junior role. Uh, and that's, that's sort of like the bar of where we put it. And it's because taking somebody, it's a risk taking somebody right out of school uh, or right out of a boot camp um, because the expectations have been set so high. How do you create real apprentice style programs that create honest to God pathways into this career, because I'm sorry, not everybody's going to be a product designer off the bat. You got to learn how to cut assets and do wireframes and do it the right way. And not the way that you were taught in general assembly. Uh, You almost have to retrain all of that. So like, how do you create a career progression? Not everybody's an architect right out of architecture school either. Right. So how do you, how do you create a pathway that as an organization, and I think this goes not only to to your inclusion hiring and your disability hiring, um, both of which are the same thing, um, different, different kinds of the same problem, but uh, you're hiring. How do you reduce your overall headcount costs and ramp your bench faster? It's if you invest in the way that you, you give people a shot and you involve them in the process um, in a way that's meaningful. Um, Trip, we have a few more minutes. I think I think you can go a bit long um, if you don't mind. But I think we have a couple of questions. Brenda, do you want to have a couple more questions, maybe? Yes. So we have a question from Laura. Are purely digital solutions in themselves ill-considered at times, just due to the fact that they rely on or assume a level of technical competency or access? Um. No. Um, because I mean, it's not, it, was, it turns out it was bad for them, but like, I mean, when my kids were babies, you know, they had all these amazing pictures of babies using iPads, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily like bad design makes it harder to use. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's a, it's a piece of, um, I was talking about this a little bit on a thread in LinkedIn today is like the difference between human centered design and user centered design is user centered design is narrowly focused around the business case of who you believe your users to be versus the human need. The only interface we ever designed for is the brain. Right. And if we assume that most of the people that have, that are using a digital experience are, you know, have the level of competence of a, 18 month old to, to, to utilize the device. Um, and there's a good business case where it needs to be expansive enough. He, a good designer is going to come up with a better way of designing that experience. Um, thank you, Trip. Robin, do you have one more question? I think we have a couple of more questions. I think we've got a couple of listens from Jeff. Um, how do you view the impact of automated hiring practices like cognitive assessments 
for building inclusive teams. I think we covered this a little bit earlier, or at least part of it. Wow, that's not a short answer. Um, I mean, because I think there's a there's a there's all sorts of wrongness about that, um, especially like what are you filtering for? I mean, there's just so many things that can go. It's just a dumb idea because uh, you're trying to put like the judgment of a computer program by humans in front of humans that are going to be working with this person uh, and, and figuring out that what somebody three layers above thinks is important in a candidate versus what the job actually is required to do. So I think there's just like off the bat, it's just a bad idea. Um, I don't, I don't believe that it's going to make a better decision. Um, Brendan, do you have one more question maybe? Yeah. Um, this is from Steph. Uh, Steph said, you mentioned that you were designed a platform with accessibility first. Do you have specific aspects of the platform that you found needed to be addressed? And how did you identify those? So um, there's a couple of times we've done that. Uh, probably the, the one that were, is like very clear was uh, Amazon Flex and the, in the courier app that we, for that, uh, which was all the drivers delivering for Amazon around the world, uh, is that we aligned on AAA accessibility in our North Star redesign. For that. So, uh, and it's because it needs to work in glare. It needs to work in low light. It needs to work at arm's length on a phone that's attached to a dashboard. Uh, it needs to not have a ton of distracting notifications. Uh, it, uh, it needs to be readable from that distance um, in all sorts of conditions. And it needs to be simple and clear on like these very, very complicated, like last mile delivery is so it's like 53% of all the shipment is in the cost of the last mile. It was like 11 and a half billion dollar scope and redesigning that made the whole system better. They actually like prioritize doing it for the entire logistics operation from end to end, not just in the last mile because of the value of that. Uh, and that's not because we were designing for blind drivers. It's because we didn't want to kill anybody to drive behind the wheel because we're distracted by this phone that you can't read, you can't see, you're not watching the road. So Chip, we're just about out of time. I want to be respectful of your time and our guest. Um, I think we're running out of questions. Um, I want to ask you, we have decided to be uh, discussing inclusive design through the lens of neurodiversity, right? Do you want to talk a bit more about the difference between neurodiversity within inclusive design versus other topics uh, that are like accessibility and, and, and other other such. I think I think it's. Um, I mean, a lot of it aligns to basic accessibility around like things like font choices, contrast ratios, especially for reading differences, attentional loading. Like you know, if you look at like limited capacity theory, Brandon, uh, you know, or or attention, you know, cognitive loading, and or all of the other things that go on with the brain, the only, that's the only interface you design for. So if you look at like more constrained versions of that, right? Um, or how do um, they, you, you can make the pretty solid argument that, you know, people with autism struggle with uh, uh, in, like, what's the intent behind a statement, right? You can make the argument that all of Twitter is autistic, right? Because it's really hard to like, there's like, the, all of what comes through in that is just like what this person said without whether they were joking or whatever, right? Like, like you have to think about like what it's, it's, it's just people. And I think, think about like those behavioral aspects, how would a rational, normal person behave if they had this constraint in their life? So. Trip, you mentioned er earlier today um, on social media somewhere, um, that you were thinking about this talk today, uh, this conversation, and and you brought up the, uh, a word, uh, dignity, designing, perhaps, I, I, to paraphrase what you said, you said something to the effect of, perhaps it's not inclusive design, perhaps it's just designing for dignity. And I really like that. And somebody said, well, maybe it's just respect. And I really like your response to, no, there's a difference between respecting people and designing for dignity. Could you unpack that just a little bit here at the end? Because I thought it was brilliant. So, uh, you know, I grew up 
Catholic, right? And so like we have this essentially the, like the essential dignity for human life. It's inherent. It's born. It's something that you can acknowledge, but you can't take it away uh, or you can take it away. You can, you can disregard it, but it is, it is essential to the person. Respect is given. Respect can be earned. You shouldn't have to earn dignity. Um, and that's, I think, so I think where, where you think about meeting people where they're at, recognizing that they're flawed people, just like we are, uh, they just have a different life experience and try to understand that to come up to a better solution. I think that's, that's sort of checking your, your privilege, uh, uh, at the door, uh, understanding that you're meeting them on equal footing. It's the difference between sort of sympathy or pity and maybe what um, compassion is, which is to suffer with, is I can at least empathize well enough to know um, I can understand how this is really bad and we should make it better. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Trip. Really appreciate you joining us today. Um, Trip, if people want to engage with you, obviously you are a wealth of knowledge in this department. Um, what do you recommend to to get a to get a hold of you? Are you are you on Twitter? Do you want people to look uh, look you up on LinkedIn? What is the best way to get a hold of you? I try to be a good person, so I stay off Twitter. Uh, like, I try to I try to be uh, reserve my my anger for some more context. Uh, uh, LinkedIn is pretty good, uh, although I get a lot of requests on LinkedIn, um, you know, but, um, you know, I, if you ask me my hot take on something, I'm like, you're probably going to get a response, right? Uh, not so much on Twitter. I don't log in on there uh, hardly ever. So. so do you have any uh, resources that you feel, I know that we've talk, we mentioned Microsoft before, they have a really nice inclusive design toolkit. Do you have any other uh, sources for designers to kind of like go and educate themselves and learn and, and get some some tips and, and framework to work with? So don't stop thinking about people as disabled and try to understand their life experience a little bit. I think there is a a great book on autism called Uniquely Human. Uh, my my youngest son is is on the spectrum. I'm beginning to believe that he may not be the only one in my family that that uh, that that. Uh, shares that that a lot of people are never diagnosed with this, right? But it gave me, it changed my understanding of, um, of what it's like to live in that, through that lens. It's like, it's a completely, they're, they're like outside observers hiding in plain sight, looking at these strange monkeys. It's like somebody put the chimps in charge of Jane Goodall, right? And that, and that's, that's, I think like where, uh, that's a, it's an, it's an interesting perspective on that. I think the other one, and this one was a real eye opener for me was dyslexic advantage, which is all the research around why, uh, places like GCHQ, the British NSA hire, they go out and recruit dyslexics, uh, because they're better at doing certain things. Uh, so there's a lot of literature out there, but I think like looking at the strengths based pieces will help you understand also where they may struggle. Uh, and, and so I think like starting from there is a, is a good spot. Those are a couple. Cool. Um, if you have any more questions, I think it's going to be a wrap for us. Trip, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your experience with us. Um, as we said, the yeah, self-disclosure piece is kind of like something that needs, kind of like needs to be worked on, but you've been great about being very open and candid and transparent about your own struggle. So I really appreciate you coming and telling us the way it is. Um, yeah. Uh, somebody just a quick shout out because I worked at Audible. Somebody asked about my favorite audiobooks on this. All those books are on Audible. So, uh, you know, I get nothing for that, but yeah, uh, I don't recommend books that aren't in audio. Very cool. Uh, thank you so much, Trip. Thank you, everybody. You've come from all over the world as usual. Thank you for, you know, Brandon, Brenda, and Robin for moderating and asking the questions. Um, we will see you for a June event. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Trip. Bye. Bye. Thank you.